Hello everyone, I am Jessica from Afro Vegan Society and welcome to the 19th day of February. We are so excited to have you all tuning in with us today for a really insightful session coming from Dr. Kadira Huff. She is gonna be speaking on teaching black kids the blueprint for health, the role of parents and plants in growing thriving children. And so we're so excited to have her speaking with us today, especially because her brand, Sprouting Wellness is the sponsor of today's session. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. If you check out the comments, you can see that you can visit her website and learn more about her work at SproutingWellness.com. But I want to just give you a quick preview of her website so that you can head on over yourself and check it out. So Sprouting Wellness is passing down a legacy of health and she offers consultations, courses, she has a blog, offers speaking opportunities as well as events and resources. She is a lifestyle doctor with a focus on plant-based wellness and she offers a seven day family wellness challenge email course. So this is just a few of the resources that you can find. Like I said, I'm just giving you a quick preview, but Dr. Huff is based in the DC area, but you can work with her virtually through these services that she offers through Sprouting Wellness. So. With that said, I think that it is time to go ahead and bring her onto the screen. And so everyone in the comments, please go ahead and comment and welcome Dr. Kadira Huff to today's stream. Hi, Dr. Huff. Hello. Hello. Hi, Jessica. Thank you for having me today. Wonderful. We're so excited for your presentation today. So I'm going to let you take it away. I'm adding your slides here and I will see you at the end of this stream. Sounds great. So my slides are up from your end, right? Yes, they are. Excellent. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Afro Vegan Society, for having me today. There are very few topics that I am as excited about talking about as plant based wellness, especially in the Black community. So there's no better time of the year. It's Black History Month. Let's dig in. So, Jessica already mentioned I'm a pediatrician and I'm also a lifestyle medicine doctor. And so, there are lots of different tenets of lifestyle medicine, which is really using the tools of lifestyle to prevent and also treat chronic disease. So, one of the core tools is our nutrition and specifically using a plant based diet to really optimize our health, not just in adulthood, but also beginning in childhood. So let us get in. So today we're going to be talking about how and why plant-based nutrition really makes a lot of sense for us in the Black community, especially getting our kids on board as early in life as possible. So a few learning points that we are going to dig into today. So first, I'm going to talk about some of the benefits of a plant-based diet. Some of this might be a little bit review. For others, this might be a little new information. Um, next, I'm going to talk about some of the unique health benefits of adding plant-based nutrition in the Black, Black community context. Why is this especially important and beneficial for us as people of color? Next, I'm going to summarize some of the evidence-based approaches for getting kids involved on board with healthy eating. We know that if that's not how your family is used to eating in terms of bringing in a lot of whole plant foods um, in the diet, that might be a little foreign and that might be a little scary and off-putting to the kids. So I'm going to bring you some tips for how to make it happen in an easy and methodical way. And then last but not least, one of my biggest points is how to bring this type of diet to the table without spending all of the money, okay? So that's how we're going to close some cost-effective strategies to bringing plant-based eating into our families. So taking a step back before we dig into the details, where are we now, right? What is the state of eating in the United States? So you can think of us in a bit of a food prison right now. We are captive to this hyper processed food environment that relies heavily on animal foods, dairy, um, and again, foods that are concentrated in sugar, fat, and salt. This is where we are. We become prisoners early on in life. As a board certified pediatrician doing primary care many days per week, I see kids get hooked on these foods early on. We're talking about those first tastes being foods that are high in sugar and fat, again, and in salt and animal protein and, and dairy. And so when that's how your palate and your taste preference are starting out early on in life, oftentimes people go their entire lives eating in this way. The good news is that there are ways that we can break out of this prison and a plant-based diet is one of those very, very strategic and high yield ways that we can turn around these trends of diet related disease. 
because the reality is there are major effects, right, of staying in this prison. It means dying earlier. It means having heart disease. It means having diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and the list goes on and on and on. But the good news is we can break out of this. And the earlier we get our kids started on a new trajectory of eating, the better, right? Because at this point in time, things are looking bleak, not just for adult health, but also for child health, where we see early onset chronic disease starting in childhood. A study came out several years ago that showed that Kids born in the year 2000, one in three of them had a risk of developing type 2 diabetes in their lifetime. Type 2 diabetes, as we all know, is a largely diet-driven disease. We can do better for our kids, and we have a tool, plant-based eating. Um, so this is where we are, but this is not where we have to be, right? Like there is definitely a choice that we have to make, and we can help to arm our kids with these tools early on. This is definitely a message of hope that I'm bringing to you today because we don't have to fall prey. We don't have to remain susceptible to this super processed food environment that we all live in. There are ways that we can break out of the matrix and I am gonna show you today. So anytime we think about starting a major change, whether it's us as adults or parents, or thinking about bringing our family along, it's extremely important to understand your why. What's your big motivation or reason for wanting to make this change, right? So your reason might be thinking about how you can give your kids a brighter future, a healthier future, um, and really turn again to the tide of your family medical history, right? A lot of us as Black folks in America, we have these family histories rampant with the heart disease and the diabetes and the cholesterol and the blood pressure issues. And we up until a point have taken for granted that that's how it has to be, but that is not the case. Your reason might be thinking about how to become a more conscious consumer, you know, in the context of climate change, in the context of, you know, animal welfare issues. There are reasons for all of us to latch onto and motivate us when the real gets bumpy, because it's going to be, right? Anytime we think about a, ma a major change, there's going to be ups and downs. So having that deep reason is very, very important. And last but not least, one of my big motivators was thinking about passing down these healthier habits to our kids. Maybe you weren't taught the exact, you know, healthiest way to eat growing up, right? But there, again, there are ways that we can create a new narrative for our family, um, starting with our kids. So big picture, when we think about the standard American diet, there are some big themes that I think are important to anchor, okay, us in this conversation. So a few things I wanted to highlight. One, most people are eating way too few fruits and vegetables. Like nine out of 10 folks are not meeting the guideline recommendations for, for vegetables, similar rates for fruit. And we are getting too much dairy or getting too much fat and salt um, and you know processed oils. So this is the big picture in terms of where we're at. And the bottom line is we have a lot of room for improvement. No matter where you are in that spectrum, there is a lot of room for improvement um, for all of us. So we have four learning topics today. So the first one is really getting into those health benefits of a plant-based diet. And when you think about those dietary gaps that we just briefly touched on, just know that a plant-predominant diet is going to really naturally fill in many of those dietary gaps and also reduce those areas of the diet globally that we're overdoing it, where we're overconsuming. So it's about kind of moderating and balancing out where we're overdoing it and when we're where we're over underdoing it. So I like to start off with a nice visual. This is from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine that highlights what does an optimal plant-based plate look like. And when I talk about plant-based with my doctor hat on, it's really focusing on an, a whole unprocessed plant-based diet as much as possible. And that's an important distinction, which I'm going to share a little bit more about later on. But bottom line is when we think about you know, the health benefits of a plant-based diet, those benefits are really steeped in eating as few processed foods as possible and as many unprocessed foods as possible. So when you look at this plate, that's exactly what you see. Does it mean that this is how you have to eat every single day? Otherwise, you're not going to get any benefit? No, right? We're human. Some days are going to be, you know, less busy, 
more busy, you know, able to pay attention to the quality of the diet more on some days than others, that's fine. But it's important to have a basis, right? Our, our guideline to try to emulate. So when you look at this plate, and this is applies to kids or adults, and this is also in, in line with the U.S. dietary guidelines, too, where we should be striving for half of our plate being fruits and vegetables, all the colors of the rainbow, different varieties. And the variety doesn't have to be on the same plate. That variety can show up throughout the week, right? It can show up, you know, day to day or even within a day, trying to bring in different colors and types of fruits and vegetables. And then a quarter of the plate, we're looking at plant protein. There's a lot of different protein options out there. We have hundreds of different types of beans, which are an amazing quality source of protein. We've got tofu, we've got tempeh, we've got nuts and seeds, which are also great sources of protein. We've got unprocessed soybeans, edamame. So the list goes on and on and on in terms of plant proteins, approximately about a quarter of the plate. Then we have the whole grains. Again, tremendous variety. When you, people think about, oh, a plant-based diet is boring, not at all. We've got variety on top of variety on top of variety. It's really limited only by our creativity. Um, and then I wanna give a plug for the herbs and spices down there, which we know as people of color, we, we can't eat it if it's not well, well seasoned, well flavored. And that is not something we have to sacrifice. Quite the contrary, the more flavor we bring into our meals, the more health promoting it is, right? We know herbs and spices have tremendous antioxidant properties. So the more flavor we add, the better it's going to be. You just got to watch the salt. All right. So this is something that I want us to have as like a baseline when we think about what a whole food plant-based diet looks like. Um, a couple quick notes with my pediatrician hat on. When we are putting meals together for children, especially young children, we do have to be aware of the fact that they do have higher fat needs, especially in that, you know, one to three to four year old range. They need more fat in their diet and they also need more protein by weight. The protein is a non-issue for the, as long as your child is getting adequate calories, they're going to be getting adequate protein. The fat we do have to pay attention to, especially if you're trying to eat more of an unprocessed diet um, that maybe doesn't include a lot of oils, but you have lots of whole fat options like our nuts and nut butters and avocado, um, olives. So those are things to just keep in mind, particularly for our young kiddos. So big picture, when we look at how do, how do things shake up, like, right, how do plant-based kids do in terms of their dietary pattern? Are they getting what they need to thrive and grow? Which is one of the big questions we have as parents, right? We want to make sure that we're not doing anything that's going to cause harm, that we're not doing anything that's going to jeopardize their ultimate growth potential, um, and that they're going to be set up to develop well. The good news is that a plant-based diet does, does that and then some. So globally, what we see with the plant-based diet in kids is that these children have higher amounts of fiber because we, are in, as a nation, and really many parts of the world, are operating with a fiber deficiency, if you will. We, are, we have stripped much of our food from its natural fiber content by processing. So when we're eating more of an unprocessed plant-based diet, we've got fiber for days, okay? lots of whole grains, lots of fruits and vegetables, most vitamins, we're getting more than the national averages for kids. And also more polyunsaturated fat, which is a more heart health promoting um, type of fat. What are plant-based kids getting less of, which is a good thing for the most part, they're getting less fat, all types. Um, sometimes they can be a little borderline with calcium. So that is something to pay attention to. Easy ways or strategies are using calcium, eating calcium set tofu, you know, adding in a couple servings of um, plant-based milk in the diet, and even some plant-based yogurts are also fortified with calcium. So those are easy ways to bring in some calcium to make sure kids are getting enough. And then vitamin D and B12, also we need to pay attention to. Vitamin D, there's been so much press over the last few years, we know, most of us are a bit deficient in it, okay? And so paying attention to fortified foods, um, again, the same ones that have calcium are also usually good sources for vitamin D as well. And then B12, I am an advocate of supplementation, um, just in terms of food sources not always being the most reliable. And because there's such devastating potential health effects of being vi vitamin B12 deficient, I advocate for just a reasonable um, daily or weekly pattern for supplementation for kids for sure. 
And last but not least, plant-based kids are getting adequate amounts of protein, calories, and iron. Um, iron I wanted to highlight because iron deficiency anemia is one of the most common micronutrient deficiencies um, in the world, actually. And what we see, it's been studied lots and lots and lots over the years, but there seem to be pretty comparable levels of iron deficiency in plant-based eaters versus um, omnivorous eaters. Okay, so that is some context in terms of what do we stand to gain? Now, as we get into some of those health benefits, it's growing by the day, our understanding of the short and long-term health benefits of a plant-based diet. When we think about kids, Plant-based diets can benefit us in terms of reduced risk of metabolic syndrome, which is this constellation of symptoms that include blood pressure, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, high blood glucose or prediabetes, diabetes on that spectrum. Um, overweight obesity is also part of this constellation. So we have reduced risk of this metabolic syndrome, which is really a precursor to many of those chronic diseases that we see show up in adulthood in full effect. Okay. So we also have asthma and eczema usually under better control in the context of a plant-based diet. And we know asthma in particular, one of the most common chronic diseases of childhood, right? And so being able to get a better hold on that in a holistic way is something that would benefit many of our kids. Um, in infancy, constipation and colic, they tend to improve when we're you know, bringing down the dairy or eliminating dairy from the diet and then reduce risk of overweight obesity. And then as kids get older, acne is a huge issue with many psychological and social implications for kids. And so having a better handle on acne as we move towards, you know, a dairy-free and meat-free diet, particularly the dairy has been implicated and worsened um, acne. This is a huge benefit for our kids, huge benefit. And the list continues to grow. Now, when we think about long-term benefits, it really parallels what we see for adults. It really does. And so for that, we see reduced risk of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, um, even being protective against Alzheimer's, which is a huge issue that's growing and our understanding expands by the day. And some select cancers have reduced incidence on a plant-based diet from prostate to breast to colorectal. So bottom line is we can set our kids up for better health in the short and long term. Is it safe though, right? As parents, we're like, that sounds great, Dr. Huff, but is it safe? We have a resounding answer. This statement comes from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. They came out with a position statement several years ago that affirmed after study and reviewing the literature that a well-planned plant-based diet is safe and also can provide many health benefits across the lifespan. And so across the lifespan are all stages of the life cycle. That's an important detail, right? Because a lot of times we're like, oh, plant-based diet might be safe for older kids, but I don't know about you know the early childhood or even bringing infants into the world um, as plant-based. It can be done and it is done. And there are many health benefits that can follow that child all throughout their life if we get into it early. All right, so this is important just in terms of background. Very briefly, though, as we get into how to bring more of this plant-based eating into our families, is all plant-based eating the same? And I wanted to bring this up because we are in a wild, new, beautiful space of so many options at the grocery store for plant-based products. And sometimes, especially if you're a newer plant-based eater, you might think that just because it has plant-based in the label, that it's going to be healthy or come with those health benefits we just finished talking about. But bottom line is it has been studied. And there are very well-defined differences between the quality of the plant-based diet and what kind of health benefits you should expect to get from that plant-based diet. So research has looked at many huge cohorts of um, study participants, looking at the nurses' health study and the health professionals' follow-up study. And they follow these folks over years and years and years and years and years to compare you know, the impact of their dietary quality on the risk of developing heart disease down the road. And so what they found was a plant-based diet was weakly associated with reduced risk of um, heart disease, which is great. Okay. We're like, okay, but shouldn't the effect maybe be a little more people were expecting a little bit more robust effect, but then they started to really get into the details and they looked at the quality of the plant-based diet and they created this index to kind of rate the dietary quality. 
based on the presence of whole foods like the fruits and veggies and whole grains versus more processed items in the diet, but still plant-based but processed. What they found was when they compared the unhealthy plant-based diet to a healthy plant-based diet, they found that there was a huge reduction in the risk of heart disease on the plant-based diet, much stronger relationship, but between more plants, um, a healthier diet and a reduced risk of heart disease, that was strong. But what they found also, which was important to know is that the unhealthy plant-based diet was associated with an increased risk of heart disease, actually. Um, and that doesn't come as a big surprise because many of these more processed products are higher in fat, and sodium and more refined in general. And so it mirrors a lot of the foods found in the standard American diet. So I just bring this up to say, we're all going to have a varied diet, right? It's not going to be all unprocessed all the time. I don't think that's you know, necessarily a reasonable expectation for most of us, but it is important to keep this distinction in mind as you're going about meal planning, as you're going about introducing foods to your, your family, that there is a balance in play. All right. Now, what is a practical approach to handling processed foods? They're there. They're abundant. The food manufacturers have realized the people are, are asking for it. The consumer demand is there. So how do we navigate it? I wanted to share these quick tips because these are things that I share within Sprouting Wellness and also I use in my own family life to just, again, create that sense of balance and moderation. So one idea is to reserve these more processed plant-based foods for special occasions. Maybe you're hosting, you're having a nice brunch, or you're going out to eat. And that might be a great occasion to have more of a processed um, plant-based item. Or you want, you're using them to supplement your normally majority whole foods diet. That's fine. Think of them more of it as a bridge you know, as you're trying to transition your family from that standard American diet to that plant-based diet, these can be thought of as bridge foods. And also thinking about how we can choose the least processed version of these when possible. And bottom line is the most important thing is to just be intentional and be thoughtful about choosing them on purpose. OK, so this is a quick, quick answer. Are the benefits of eating a plant based diet all or nothing? No, 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 they are not. You do not have to be 100%, but the more closely you start to turn your family's dietary pattern towards plant-based eating, the more health benefits you will get. And we have seen that um, in the literature, actually, as every step you take towards more plant-based eating, as well as reducing your dietary input of meat and dairy and more processed foods, we get those health benefits, specifically reduced risk of death right? Like who doesn't want that to live longer, but not just live longer, but to live a longer, healthier life. That's what can happen as you even incrementally move your diet towards a plant-based one. I put this up here because I don't want us to think that perfection is the goal. Even imperfect action in this direction will yield dividends for you and your family. All right. So moving on to what we have to gain specifically within that Black health community, within the Black community, what are those benefits to us specifically? And this is important. It's Black History Month. Every day is Black History Day. But we're here. So I wanted to share a few stats that really help to anchor why we particularly need to be thinking about bringing our families, our nuclear families and extended families along for the ride of plant-based eating. This is nothing new. Unfortunately, I hate to get into these, uh, these statistics. They can be a little bleak. But bottom line is we as Black Americans have higher rates of pretty much all the chronic diseases of today that are most responsible for premature death. From heart disease, which is on that spectrum, from high blood pressure, which is rather on the spectrum of heart disease, diabetes, stroke, we are more likely to die from all causes than all other races. This has many, 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 many underlying factors from systemic racism to housing to economic disparities, you know, all vestiges of slavery, essentially. But in terms of a more kind of proximal or individual level factor that we can do something about today, our food is a place, it's a lever that we can use to turn this around. Because the bottom line is, despite the fact that all these other kind of social and political factors impact and influence our risk of health disparities, the reality is all of these conditions are also dietary driven. 
they're all diet related. So that gives us a lot of power to do something to benefit and take charge of our health today, despite the context in which we live in the United States. So the message is reclaiming our health or reclaiming our food is a way to reclaim our health. And we know that this is critical, is urgent. The pandemic has brought this to, to the view. We cannot ignore it any longer. The time is now for us to take action and to bring our children up to speed in terms of the importance of food and our health, okay? Now, I already mentioned this, that food is one piece of the puzzle. And so I always bring this into my, my, my conversations with the community because I never want to, I never want to ignore or sidestep the fact that yes, food is critical, but it is a piece of the puzzle as we try to move towards a more health equitable society. And we know plant-based eating is on the rise. This is a message that has taken off. We're flying with it. We're running with it. And for many of us, it's a way to go back to our roots as you know, people of color, descendants of the African diaspora, and the fact that many of our people on the continent of Africa are majority plant-based eaters. This is not, we're not new to this, right? We've been true to this. And so everybody else is kind of getting on board and re remembering and recognizing the fact that, yes, this is a part of our, our history and culture. And at this point, we're the fastest growing demographic of plant-based eaters in this country. And I suspect that's going to keep growing um, as more of us become just more tuned into the fact that this is a place that we can intervene and our families as individuals to take charge of our health, where we don't have to rely on the healthcare system. We don't have to rely on the political environment to you know, step up and do the right thing. We can do something today by virtue of our plate. And this is one example of what that plate might look like. And it just kind of links where we are to where we've been as, again, people of the African diaspora and linking the traditional food ways of the continent to our food traditions even to this day and realizing that many of our um, kind of traditional plates when we were on the continent were really founded on the beans, legumes, whole grains, fruits, veggies, nut seeds. And so this power plate, which was created in collaboration, a black um, nutritionist um, along with the Physicians Committee, they came out with this a while ago. And I think that it's just a really nice kind of summary and drawing those connections, which are important for us to tap into. Our next topic is really getting into how can we bring some practical strategies of plant-based eating and exposing our kids to all these wonderful health-promoting foods. How can we really bring that into our families starting today? right? All the information we've covered so far in terms of the health benefits of plant-based eating, what we stand to gain as people of color, um, as plant-based eaters, that's all great. But how do we put that into practice, right? What are some really actionable steps that we can take? And that's what we're going to get into right now. And this is a topic that I see a lot. And parents come to me all the time in terms of, but how, but how, how can I get my kid interested in more fruits and vegetables? This is a quote that I love that really captures the how. Really, this is the secret sauce for many situations that you might encounter. Adults teach nutrition by serving and enjoying the foods we want our kids to eat. This is the secret sauce, y'all. It might be inconvenient at times, but this is the reality of what's... Um, one of the most effective tools is us. It's our modeling. It's being parents or other loved one, adult loved ones in the home. Um, kids learn to eat by the context in their family usually. That's like the, the first teacher is home, right? And so parents play this role as being health promoters, role models, educators in the lives of our kids. And these food preferences that we talk so much about they take hold early in life. They take hold early in life. So the earlier that we can begin to expose our kids to a wide variety of foods and tastes and textures, we are going to be serving them well for the rest of their lives. We lay the groundwork early on in life. So this is a concept that is really important in, in, in light of this conversation about modeling and you know meals at home. This is the concept of division of responsibility. So this was created and popularized by Ellen Satter, who's both a family therapist plus reg registered dietitian. And so bottom line is she really broke down when you think about feeding your child, um, which is a core parenting skill, you know, feeding our children is a core parenting skill. There is there are strict roles here at play that maybe we're not always aware of. So the parent 
is responsible for what to feed the child, right? The quality of meals, when to feed the child, you know, the times of meals and snacks and where to feed. Are we sitting at the table? Are we sitting on the couch? Where does mealtime go down? So that's what we as a parent are responsible for orchestrating at home. Our children, on the other hand, also have a responsibility to play. And it might be a little wild to think about even small children having a responsibility at mealtime, but they do. And I think the more we get comfortable with that concept, the more we're able to over, uh, avoid or sidestep some power struggles that often take place at mealtime, especially if you're introducing foods that might be a little foreign or taste different than what your kid is used to. So the child is responsible for how much they eat and whether they eat from what is offered. So how much and yes or no, am I going to eat this? And that is a very uncomfortable realization. And I've been there. I'm a mom of a four-year-old. Trust and believe. I know how awkward and uncomfortable that thought can be. But the reality is the more we stay in our individual lanes and allow our child to develop an autonomous relationship with food at mealtime, the better off we'll all be and the better off we're able to create a more harmonious, fun, pleasant eating environment, which is really the backdrop to being more, ex, you know, more adventurous or taking more food risks as a child. If it's contentious, if it's uncomfortable, if there's frustration at the dinner table, then the kid is going to clam up and just like stay in their lane and eat what they're used to. So having this division of responsibility as a framework really is the backdrop to, you know, nice, pleasant, adventurous meals and being able to expose our kids to a variety of healthy foods. We want them to eat and know and love. So these are some general feeding principles. I'm not going to read each one, um, but suffice it to say, there are some general ways to create the context of a warm, nurturing food environment. Role modeling, you know, making sure we are trying to lessen that you know, power struggle that we talked about just now with the division of responsibility, trying to avoid pressuring your child. That does not work. Kids we know are the most stubborn little creatures on earth. They will hold out on you as long as possible um, to get what they want, right? And so just sidestepping that totally as much as possible is really, really important. And we're going to get into some ways, alternatives to putting pressure on our child. Um, and then one thing I did want to highlight was this concept of notice when you you're, take your emotional, your pulse, right? If mealtime is starting to get kind of frustrating and you feel yourself losing your cool, then that's a time to take a step back and remember your child is going to be fine if there's one or two not ideal meals in the span of the week or even day. Um, big picture, if you are really trying to focus on the what they're eating, and the when they're eating and the where they're eating, then by and large, they're going to be getting what they need, right? Food is cumulative. Nutrition is cumulative. It is not founded on one meal. So just breathe, be easy, and just take it one meal at a time. So here are some ideas that we're going to be moving forward into getting into of how, what to do when your kids don't bite. So there are some common barriers that kids have in terms of uh, their food. So one is they just don't list, they don't like the food in terms of how it looks, you know, how it tastes or the texture. Those can all be really big turnoffs for kids. And just knowing that for many children, they go through this natural period of, it's called food neophobia, where new foods just weird them out. They're not interested. Um, and then also kids go through this cautious or picky eating phase, quote unquote, that usually is around, you know, two to six years old. That can be a very common response to new foods. And so I put this here just as a reminder to the fact that kids naturally go through these phases and we just have to be a little bit creative in terms of helping them sidestep them. So how do we overcome those taste objections when it's just like, ugh, your kid's like, yuck, I don't like that. This is not good to me. Even if it's, you know, objectively, maybe pretty good, but they're just like, I'm not feeling it. So what do you do then? Repeated, repeated, repeated exposures. That's one of the biggest takeaways I have. Do not give up the faith. A lot of times mealtime can be, again, I know it's frustrating. And sometimes you're just like, I want to give up and I want to give them what they want so that we can move on to other parts of our day. I get it. However, 
when you do that and you, you stop introducing those healthier foods in the diet, then they're going to lose out on those repeated exposures and those chances to learn to like those new flavors. It's a learned process and learning takes time and it takes practice. And so that's exactly the language that I encourage using with your children, really of all ages, is we have to practice to like new foods. And also, I don't expect you to like everything, but my goal is to have us both be willing to try and explore, even taking bites. This concept of flavor training, it starts in childhood, in infancy, really, in the context of breastfeeding or those first tastes of foods when we're introducing solids. And this idea of learn safety around new foods this comes with time. And again, those positive experiences and knowing, hey, I tried it, I didn't die. <laughs> you know, I tried it and over time it kind of tasted good. So kids have to have just ample opportunities to learn new food. So again, offer, offer, offer again. Some kids might need up to 15 to 20 exposures of the food over time for the, it to become acceptable or even liked. Another thing to keep in mind is this idea of sight objections, like when food just doesn't look that appetizing. We know we've been to restaurants or maybe like put something on the plate and it just doesn't look that good. Or we go to somebody's house and you're just like, mm, that doesn't look appealing. Even if they swear up and down and sideways that it's really tasty and you're just like, mm -mm, I can't do it because it just doesn't look palatable. Kids are the same way. They want their food to look good. And that to them, what looks good might be different than us as parents. It needs to have sometimes a little bit of fun, a little bit of whimsy. And so I never, I never thought that I'd be a mom who got the, you know, the little the food cutouts and for different shapes and everything. This is my life. You know, this has been my life of just adding some fun and visual interest to the plate. And that definitely makes kids more interested and more liable to try new foods. And so just re realizing when food rejection starts before they even taste it, that's when it's time to brainstorm about how can I put a plate together that's going to be more visually appealing to my child. Another strategy that really helps in terms of making your kid more, helping your child be more open to new foods is keep it spicy. And I don't mean well, spices definitely for one, but also the variety, you know, trying different colors, trying different types and adding that into the diet so that they don't get played out on the same, you know, three or four foods. Even if they're like, they swear up and down, like this is only, this is the only thing I like. This broccoli is the only thing I like. Well, if we're a fan of broccoli, that's green. We can play a game. What is a new green vegetable that we can try this week? And so kind of ping pong off of something that's known in terms of a quality or characteristic, and then bring in a new thing. Or for instance, broccoli looks like a tree. What is another tree-like vegetable that we can bring in and try this week, like cauliflower? And so it's just, it's a little bit of creativity. It's meeting your child where they are, but remembering that we need to be also intentional about keeping things interesting and varied as much as possible. So just as a quick summary of these, I call them food parenting tips. You want to make the healthy choice the easy choice through the availability, availability of healthy foods at home. Um, and this is important in terms of us being at home a lot more with the pandemic, right? And I know all of our food habits have been really turned upside down. And so when snack time comes and meal time comes, we want to make sure that there are healthy, quick options available so that that becomes slowly the default instead of the more processed um, or animal-based foods too. Using that power of role modeling um, wisely. And I say wisely because kids are watching, good or bad. If we're sitting back, you know, with the pint of ice cream at the end of the day, we have our little stash of snacks. The kid knows we have the stash of snacks and they know full time well we're eating them. And so um, they're taking note of that, but they're also taking note of when we're sitting down at the table with them and we're eating that big bowl of salad alongside them. They're watching, they're taking note. They're, this is a normalizing behavior. And so, really, the literature on nutrition and healthy eating in kids, it repeats over and over and over again the importance of um, modeling a healthy diet for our kids. Um, preparing foods and presenting them in the way that's going to be enticing, we covered that. And then also pairing a, a new food with a food that's already well liked, right? And I would take it a step further to even introducing a new food that ping pongs or plays off of a food that's already liked. Like if your kid's already a fan of sweet potato, or uh, which are nice and vibrant orange, what's another orange fruit or vegetable that we can introduce that's new? Well, maybe it's a butternut squash, right? There's similar textures and can be prepared in similar ways, but it's different and new. And that's going to add some new nutritional profile 
um, benefits to the diet as well. Now, just as well as we talk about things to try to add into our food parenting toolkit, it's also important to think about what do we want to avoid? What are some of the things that really have been shown to backfire or just simply not be that effective? Pressuring a child to eat never works. It might help to get you an extra bite or two at that meal, but then it looks like you do some additional damage down the line in terms of setting up this kind of confrontational dynamic at the dinner table that's just not worth it. We want as much as possible for that table to be a safe space. Um, and in light of that, we don't want to use food-based rewards. This does not work in the long term, and it ends up setting up this... Um, Sometimes it can become a little bit of a dysfunctional relationship with food where we look to food for reasons other than nourishment habitually, right? When we're looking to, you know, treat ourselves and food and usually the food that we choose in the context of a reward is going to be more processed, maybe higher in sugar, maybe, you know, a dairy type product. And so thinking specifically about keeping food for food, um, for nourishment, for fueling our bodies, and then thinking about other non-edible ways to add happiness and fulfillment and reward to the to your life. Like maybe it's stickers or a nice family outing, but really trying to divorce food from that reward-based um, system in our brains. The last thing I would really emphasize, especially in the context of the pandemic, is unstructured meals and snacks. I find that kids are grazing all day long, just like we are as adults. And so setting up times, you know, in terms of when are we having breakfast roughly? When is lunch? When is uh, the morning snack happening? When is lunchtime? You know, afternoon snack and dinner. And so that there's a shared model so that kids are not grazing all day long. Because then what happens is they're not hungry when it comes to mealtime. Um, practical tips for raising some healthy eaters. Really, this is a summary of what we just covered. One of the biggest things I'm going to bring up now is leading by example, right? And then really trying to offer that variety, make sure that it's available. And this is something I do want to emphasize is trying to have a shared eating system in the home where nobody's being singled out, right? Um, we want to make sure that everybody is generally eating similar foods and that people aren't being singled out in terms of having a more restrictive diet or they're not allowed to have things, but other folks are allowed to have the other things. We want it to be as um, consistent as possible, especially when it relates to kids. We never want to single them out to do something that everybody in the home is not also being held to a similar standard. So now we are going to transition into our final topic of this afternoon, which is just a few approaches to bringing in these healthier foods, these plant predominant foods into the diet without spending all the money in the bank. So I call this eating your greens without spending all your green. <laughs> so some ideas for plant-based eating on a budget. So one of my biggest tips for saving money while eating a plant predominant diet is cooking at home. Cooking at home is a wonderful way to save money. And there are a lot of other benefits that I just wanted to quickly highlight here to having family meal time. And so some of those benefits, and these are all research backed benefits, the kids do better in school. They have less risky behavior in teenagehood. They develop healthier habits around food generally. There's an improved sense of self-esteem. And parents also feel better when they have this shared ritual with their children. It's a way for them to really tap in and enjoy parenthood. And I definitely, I feel this every time we make family meal time a priority. It's just a way for you to put everything down. You know, where we're caught in this rat race. Meal time is a great place to connect. And so remembering all this and the fact that it's a great way to save money, it's just some additional motivation to make it happen as often during your busy week as possible. The next big tip in terms of saving your green is meal planning, right? We can't have family meal time without ideally a meal plan. So we have a roadmap for the week, right? We're not going in willy nilly because that's stressful. It tends to create more trips to the grocery store, overspending, even spontaneous eat outs that weren't on plan that end up creating more money usage on food. So when you plan a couple hours, even one hour every week in terms of what are we going to eat this week? What's for dinner? What are we packing for lunches? Even if it's just a loose picture that you can use to create your grocery list, this is going to help you save so much money. Why? Because you get to kind of combine ingredients. You get to, again, anticipate when you are going to be eating out. Um, and it just saves time as well. And time, as we know, is money. 
One thing I do want to highlight here is the fact that when you're meal planning, you can still plan on an eat out night. For instance, in my family, we usually do Saturday night is our eat out night. And then the other six days per week, my kid knows we're eating at home. Right. And so when she's like, mommy, I want I'm like, mm, that's going to be for Saturday night, hun. And so let's stick with what our meal plan is. And that's the way to keep me accountable, you know, for my healthy eating goals and also to teach her this principle of moderation. Um, now, the next thing I wanted to highlight was this concept of not fearing frozen fruits and fruits and vegetables. They are a really acceptable and time saving and cost effective way to get fruits and veggies in your family's diet. And they've been studied to just compare. A lot of times people are worried that if I eat frozen, am I going to get the same nutritional punch as eating fresh? And the answer is, yeah, more or less, they actually are comparable. And in some cases, you get an even bigger nutritional punch by eating frozen because they tend to pick them when the fruits and veggies are at their ripest. And so the, um, not the phytochemical content, the antioxidant content might be at peak when it's actually picked and then preserved. So bottom line is this is a totally great way um, to save money. And then the other thing I want to highlight is, let's say you have an abundance of some fresh produce that you bought that week, freeze it, freeze it. If you know you're not going to eat it all, put it up in a Ziploc bag, label it, put it in the freezer, and you don't have to waste your money. Other ideas to cut down on food waste, which is a huge source of um, money literally being thrown out in the, in the garbage, freezing those leftovers. As soon as you cook them, you've had them for maybe for a couple of days, freeze the excess, put that date, label what it is, throw it in the freezer. But then the next point is you need to schedule in maybe freezer clean out nights in your meal plan, right? Because otherwise those bad boys will stay in the freezer for if God knows how long and never get eaten. And so it only helps you if you go back into the freezer and I've been guilty of this and actually eat those items. Um, you also want to pay attention to the optimal way to store foods in your refrigerator using those crispers, you know, using you know, not putting things that are more likely to perish on the door because that's more temperature labile. You want to make sure that you're using your refrigerator wisely. And that's a whole thing that you could be researching online. I'm not going to get into that today. Um, and realistically planning your food ahead. In light of that, shopping with a purpose, keeping that grocery list going. There's lots of great apps that you can use. Um, keeping that running list of food items that you need so that when it is time to go, you're not scratching your brain like, what did we need this week? Um, and also making sure you check your pantry and your freezer before you go shopping. And really limiting your grocery store trips to no more than once a week. The research is finding that the more trips we, we take, duh, we're going to spend more money. So the more we can do everything in one fell swoop and be consolidated, um, the better. And don't go hungry. <laughs> um, last but not least, I wanted to really focus on, again, those whole plant foods. This is a picture of my, she was about one and a half, two years old here. One of our partial grocery store hauls in terms of, you know, this is a whole plant foods in action. Staying away as much as possible from the things that promise things like, oh, we're, this is healthy and this is all natural. If it has to say it's healthy or all natural on it, be critical and be be wary. Look at that ingredient list and see if it, it matches. Um, sticking with the perimeter of the grocery store will be most cost effective and also be a lot healthier because then you won't get sucked into as many of those more processed foods. This is something that I have available on, on my website, um, some more meal planning tips, but just some general things in review, batch cooking, um, making sauces in advance that you can add to your meals to kind of jazz up leftovers, um, doubling recipes when you have something that's really popular and freezing it so that, again, you can save time on busy weeknights. There are lots of ways to really master this meal planning, which is a big tool to saving money. And as you start to build out recipes that are plant-based and that are well-liked by your family, create this core family recipe list because then you don't have to reinvent the wheel every single week in terms of what are, we, what, what are we making, what's popular, what did they like that time? Even on a notes app on your phone, just write down the things that were popular because by and large, when the time comes to meal plan, I don't know about you, but I often forget like, what did I make three weeks ago that people really liked? I forget. So writing those things down really helps me. So I'd encourage you to do the same, to create your family recipe list that are full of plant-based recipes. These are some meal plan ideas for breakfast, lunch, and dinner that are really popular with kids that are all plant-based. 
you know, from oatmeal to making your homemade granola, whole wheat pancakes, avocado toast, tofu scramble, the list goes on and on. I'm getting hungry reading this list, so I'm not going to read any more, but this is just for you to peruse and just get a sense in terms of the variety possible of kid-friendly, um, very nutritious, plant-based meal ideas. And do not forget dessert. There are lots of great plant-based items that are healthy um, and also plant-based that are going to be really still health promoting, but also satisfy that sweet tooth um, in your family. Nice cream is one of my family favorites, like using the frozen bananas to whip up really nice into pretty much a frozen yogurt. You can add in, you know, other frozen fruits and become like a fruity ice cream. One of my faves and whip it up in five minutes or less. Um, and then let's see here. These are some of my favorite cooking blogs. I have a handout on my website under the resource tab that really lists many of these um, cooking blogs that just give you some um, inspiration in terms of what can you cook for your family that's going to be tasty and plant-based and healthy. And these last two resources I wanted to share, one from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and this is a, a whole food plant-based um, guide. It's a week-long meal plan. And then this is a very long guide on the um, Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies that goes over how to eat plant-based on a budget. So both of these, screenshot them. These are great, um, great resources. And so start where you are, you know, every plant counts. This is something that is a journey for all families. Um, usually small sustainable changes are the ones that are going to last. And so focus on that and bring your family along in a compassionate way and know that every plant counts. So every step you take towards more of a plant-based diet is going to have dividends for your family. Um, and it's okay if you're starting from a certain place and you're gradually moving towards that, you know, even you know, vegan or 100% plant-based diet or even someplace a little shy of that. Every step you take in that direction is going to be beneficial um, for your family in the short and long term. I love this quote as a pediatrician. It is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. This is our goal as parents, as grandparents, aunts and uncles. We want to build our kids up from the ground as strong as possible to have the thriving futures that we know they deserve. So that is what I have for you today. Feel free to contact me. I am on social media. Um, feel free to screenshot this, follow along, tag me if you got anything beneficial from the presentation today. And I would love to hear from you on my Sprouting Wellness platform. Thank you so much. That's all I have for you. Wow. Thank you so much for your presentation today, Dr. Huff. It was so, so packed with information and resources that I think our audience is really going to be able to use. So thank you for that. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Um, are there any courses or any uh, offerings that you have coming up that people can participate in if they're looking yes. for more from you? I do. I do. I have an event coming up on March 5th. It's Saturday, March 5th. That is a plant-based meal plan workshop, a meal prep workshop that I'm collaborating with a local um, cooking instructor. She's um, African-American. She's plant-based. She's a mom. And so we are collabing on about a 90-minute workshop. So that's Saturday, March 5th. And so the link to register, I can throw in to our chat, Jessica. Okay. Um, that could be helpful to share with everybody. And then later in the year, just I do also have um, a relaunch of my plant-based boot camp for parents that I hosted last year, which was really well received. So I'm going to be relaunching that. It's like a four-week group coaching experience about how to bring your family along the journey of more plant-based eating at home. Um, so that's something to just, if you are not on my listserv, then join and you will be the first to know when it's time to launch later in the year. That's wonderful. And so if folks want to find it, about any information, they can visit sproutingwellness.com and find the links to all of the resources and upcoming events that you mentioned. Exactly. Exactly. That's always a good way to go. And also on Instagram. I'm trying to step up my Instagram. Uh, presentation. <laughs> but yeah, usually I post everything on there that's coming up too. Okay, wonderful. Well, once again, thank you so much for having us. Folks in the comments, please, you know, let Dr. Kudira know that we appreciate her and also definitely follow up, follow her, get in contact with her. And um, we look forward to having you back for a future event or presentation. Thank Dr. You. I would love that. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.
All right, so this was another amazing live session during February, and we have so much more to come. Next week, we have a cooking demo coming up on Tuesday, and we also have our virtual happy hour on Friday at 6 p.m., so you don't want to miss out on any of that. So if you want to get the latest and greatest updates about all things Afro-Vegan Society in February, you need to go ahead and like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or follow us on Facebook, and sign up for February at afroveganSociety.org slash February, and we look forward to connecting and interacting with you all then. Until the next time, bye everybody.